Hello everyone and welcome to Linux Forensics here at Pentester Academy. In this video we are going to start talking about what happens after you verify that there was in fact some sort of a breach. So in the previous video we detected some anomalous behavior and the next thing you need to decide is should I take the system down or not? And it really depends on the situation. Now, based on my interview with the users, which of course I recorded in my bound notebook, I know that this system in question is actually a developer's workstation. So if I take that down, it's not like people are going to lose business. You know, the developer might lose some productivity, but we need to investigate what happened. So we'll pause for a second, and I just wanted to show you some things that you could do if you are forced to deal with a live system and you need to do some additional study. So we talked about how you can send files that are suspicious over before. Uh, for example, we noticed in a previous video that this system had users that shouldn't be able to log in logging in. So we might want to investigate things like bin false. Has somebody altered that somehow to allow people to log in that shouldn't? Uh, other things that we can look at. So here's a couple of simple scripts that I've written that you could use if you're forced to do some sort of live response. You have a system you just can't shut down or not shut down for very long. Now note that the longer the system is up and running, the lesser the chances of your getting some good evidence collected in order to catch whoever did something. So here, this first one is called send file info, and it's just a simple script. And what it does is you give it one parameter, a starting directory, and then for everything under that directory, it will print out a bunch of file information in a semicolon delimited file. This is handy if you want to import this into OpenOffice, Calc, or something similar for some later analysis. You want to sort by dates, etc. And the reason that I gave it a parameter of a starting directory is you know, if you do this on the entire file system, it's going to take a while. And you might not really need to do the entire file system either. So this allows you to do just a little bit, whatever you think is appropriate. And this script is primarily here in this one line. So I'm going to log. I'm calling my logging script. And I'm doing a find. And I'm starting wherever you told me to start and I'm going to print out some information. So the information that I'm printing here is the access date, the access time, modified date, modified time, creation date, creation time, file attributes, the user ID, the user name, group ID, group name, file size, and the file name. You can get all this information, incidentally, uh, if you wanted to do something similar but a little bit different, by looking at the man page for the find command. And it'll tell you what all of these different flags mean, all these different tokens. Another thing you might want to do is you might want to collect all of the log files. So I wrote another simple script for that. So here, I don't take any parameters. And it calls send log shell again. And I'm using another find command. And I'm doing a find from var log, where the logs are normally stored. and I'm only interested in files, and I'm going to use a regular expression, and I'm going to use a 
POSIX extended regular expression that lets me use some of the features that I wouldn't normally be allowed. Let me scroll this up here a little bit. I will search for var log and then something that contains only letters and possibly a period. In other words, I don't want things like old log one, old log two, etc., that might be stored, at least not for now. And to that, I have at least one of those. And to that, I will add a slash and the same thing again, at least one of those. And that could be repeated. So this eliminates all of those files that are backups. And I will call exec and I will echo that I am dumping a certain log file. And when you're using find like this, the brackets are replaced with the file name. Then I do another exec and I cat the file, and then I do a final exec, and I cat end of dump for a log file. And this will put all of this into my log. Again, this might take a while because you'll go through several logs, literally every log on the system. Another useful thing you might wanna do, looking at the history what was each user doing on the system? So how do we do that? Again, we're gonna use find. So first we do a find on the home directories. We're looking only for files. We're again using a regular expression. And I'm going to look in home slash and then some user ID at least one of those, and then slash, and then dot bash history. Now, it should be noted that if they're not using bash, if they're using some other shell, you will not necessarily get their history file with this script. But bash is the most common shell that's used for Linux systems. So you might need to adjust this somewhat if you find that people are using a different shell. And again, this is just a preliminary thing to do on a live system. And we do the same thing here again. We just echo a banner at the start, cat the file, echo a banner at the end. And then I also repeat this using slash root, the admin user's home directory. Again, this is the default value. If you have a non-default value on your system, you would have to adjust. Finally, the last script that I wrote here that might be useful is called send SHA-256. So what this will do is it takes one parameter, again, a starting directory, because you probably don't want to do the entire file system you know, maybe just something you suspect has been changed. And for every file that it finds, that's an actual file, the dash X dev option here for find says, do not descend into other file systems. So if there's a link to another file system, don't go there and execute SHA-256 sum on a binary file and here's the file name. Incidentally, if you wanted to use something like an MD5 hash, you could, you could just substitute MD5 sum. Uh, normally, I do not like to use MD5. It's not considered cryptographically safe anymore. There are some people, however, that like to use it. And you might find a bunch of MD5 hashes for good binaries and not as much for SHA-256 values. So that's just a little note how you could change that.
Well, that's all for this video. As always, if you're enjoying these videos here at Pentester Academy, please tell a friend. We'll see you next time.